Okay. Um, welcome, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Maria Prieto, and I'm one of the co-founders here at Film Roundtable. Um, the video recording to this, you can find in our vault where we've stored all our previous discussions. And hopefully you're listening to this on our podcast, which we're very excited about. Um, I'm thrilled to be sitting here with these four directors, but before I introduce them, um, I wanna hold a moment of silence, which is something that we've done since our first round table. Um, you know, a moment of silence to honor all 1,460,179 reported worldwide COVID deaths as of today. Um, and that's 266,758 in the US alone. And again, that's reported. So those numbers really aren't as accurate as we think. Um, we'd also like to honor all of our black and brown brothers and sisters, as well as our First Nations brothers and sisters whose lives have been taken by the hands of police brutality and other senseless acts of violence. So. Thanks guys. Um, yeah, like I said, we've been holding these moments of silence since the beginning. Um, and, you know, it's just, I find it to be incredibly important as we continue to return to work, go on set and just live our lives to go so with an awareness of safety and just empathy to everyone that, you know, we come into contact with. Um, which kind of brings me to you guys, you know, these four directors all have a body of work that exhibits empathy, um, that really has a sensibility. Um, so that being said, we have Haley Elizabeth Anderson joining us from New York. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> no, thanks for being here. We have Camilla Bell in Los Angeles. Hello, thanks for having me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Pat Haywood over in New York. Namaste, folks, what's going on? and Jamil McGinnis in Atlanta. Salam, everyone. Thanks for having me. Of course, thank you all for being here. Um, you know, there's so much that we can dive into and sometimes it's a little overwhelming to figure out where to, you know, really get the conversation going. But I find that the beginning's usually the best way to go. Um, and just, you know, the journeys and the paths that led each of you into this moment in your careers. So. Haley, I want to start with you just because you have a very diverse background. You know, you've touched on so many creative processes from like playwriting to casting to photography. So I just, I want to hear a little bit about how you fell into each of those roles and how they've now influenced you as a director. Um, so I started, I think officially started making films, of course, during like film school and undergrad, but before that, I think my only entryway into it was through writing um, and through taking pictures. Um, I never really had access to like a film camera or a DV cam or anything like that. So all I had was like these notebooks that I would keep and like make all these stories and, and do poetry and then um, disposable cameras and, and tape recorders actually. So I would kind of construct everything. It was like a photo roman, like those exercises that you do. I was doing that before um, I went to film school. And so I think film school was my only way in. It was the only thing that I could see. And it, it was just like by chance that I think one of my parents were, were found out that there was like a film school in Austin. And I was like, okay, I guess that's what I'll do. Um, so I did that. And, and I think if once I, it was a long road to kind of getting into the film school. Um, because I moved around a lot, I, I was homeschooled and then like there was no ranking. So I was just like thrown into another school and then I had to transfer. So it was a long, a very, very long road. And then when I got to UT Austin, I still didn't really have a clue about how to make a film. And it was again by chance that I kind of wandered into a theater where a bunch of students were showing films and I got the flyer and, and it said like film class showcase. And I was like, oh, oh, there's a film class. I was very, very directionless, even though I like knew what I wanted to do. I was just, there was nobody that really kind of told me. I think they would have told me like, go to your counselor, but I had no, I was just very, very lost. Um, and so I kind of fell into that class and with like zero confidence, I like presented a script and it got picked. And then I was like, oh, I guess I'm making my first film now. And 
made that and then made another one and I graduated after like I, I started working in casting as an intern um and the first thing that they like the first NDA they gave us which I guess I don't I've really broken that <laughs> I've been talking about it a lot was um a Terrence Malick project and I I was just like this is this feels almost like cosmic because um like, because later on I started, you know, we did like commercials and, and some other small projects, but the first two projects that I got to work on were really big movies and they were all searching for non-actors and all on the street. So I got a really good education, probably even better than the classes that I was taking during casting. Um, and and like when I was kind of in classes, I, I was trying to experiment with this which now I know is like hybrid documentary, hybrid filmmaking, but I didn't really know that's what I kind of, that's what it was called. Um, so like that experience kind of gave me the freedom to think of film in the way that I had already kind of seen it in my head, but like it, it gave me a container to kind of put it in. Mm -hmm. um, and then right after undergrad, I applied for grad school. <laughs> it's, it's very boring. Um, <laughs> I applied for grad school um, knowing that I probably couldn't afford it, but I just took the chance and I was like, okay, maybe I'll get a scholarship. If not, I won't go. If I do, I'll go. And I did. Um, and I got a scholarship and so I moved. <laughs> I was like, I'm out of here. I was in Texas. So um, it was the change that I needed because I, I felt like I didn't make enough in my original voice. I feel like mm -hmm. early on, I was trying to make films for the audience maybe or um not really i mean like i indulged in what i loved but i think what i really wanted to say i kept hidden because i didn't feel the environment maybe supported it as much um and then once i got to new york i felt like okay people actually care about what you have to say it's it's all about kind of developing your voice um and yeah and i've been here for five years and I'm now like in a different, a different point. I think Pat, you were talking about changing and how you see your own work. I, I feel like now I'm finally getting to the point where I wanted to be back in undergrad. Mm. Um, so yeah, just very film school path. Have you gone back to Texas like since to shoot stuff there? I haven't, I will. I'm, I'm trying to make some of my feature there. Um, mm -hmm. I've gone back here and there just like for summers. But a part, big part of my feature takes place in my um, hometown, Houston. Mm. So, mm. yeah, really looking forward to going back and shooting some things there. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, I think I go back to photography because that's just how I started photography and writing, and um, going back to just taking as many photographs as I can. Um, I think there's two parts of me I see like there's the I want to capture my life and I want to capture the people that I love in the moment that they're here. Um, and that's one side. And then there's another side that's extremely slow where I take a photo a month where I feel like it's it's a planned thing. Um, so I kind of have these two two sides that I kind of work in, um, trying to develop more, put, put, putting more care. I'm trying to put more care in the, the slow side. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise I just, I just, I shoot film like on my point and shoot like crazy just because after I develop a huge batch, I but I figure out, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad I took that photo of that person. I'm glad I have this this moment with this person. Um, yeah. Kind of a anxious habit that I have um, because I see some photos and like, I almost didn't bring my camera that day. I almost don't have this memory. Um, yeah, so. Well, no, I mean, that's something that all of us as filmmakers have. It's like an obsession to capture a moment yeah. of life. Yeah. So that makes complete sense. Yeah. Um, Pat. I want to shift to you for a minute because you and I have a similar background in that we've both worked um, with directors, you know, as our assistant and, you know, seeing that every director is incredibly different. I'm sure we've had very different experiences, but I think one of the things I learned the most when I worked um, with a director for a couple of years was that after a while, there was a really deep sense of trust and, you know, we'd walk onto a set and, he'd look at me and be like, well, how would you shoot this? How would you block this? And, you know, I tell him and he'd usually never listen to anything I said, but um, it did kind of teach me to just be prepared mm -hmm. always, even though I wasn't even the director, but it kind of like forced me to have a director's mindset. So I'd love to just know a little bit about 
what you've learned working with Miles um, mm. and how it's helped you hone in your skills? Yeah, that's a, an, I mean, it's a great question. I, I've learned so much from working with him, you know, to kind of go in a little slightly existential way and then I'll try to bring it into, you know, the, the personal, I, you know, I grew up without, um, without a dad and I had a like pretty rough home without any male role models in my life. And um, so I grew up really being around, uh, being comforted by the women in my life who raised me. And um, that, I did, I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately that I, I never realized how much I carried that in with me into my adult life. I thought I, I kind of had a narrative in my head about how I dealt with it and then I brought that out into the world. But then recently I realized that it actually really infected a lot of the ways that I lived my life. And I, I say that to say, um, when I began working with Miles, I thought of it as a career decision where I was working with somebody who was uh, successful doing a thing that I saw myself doing and okay, well, I can do this. And, you know, since we started working together, we've been, we've been working for, I think a little over two years now. And it, it qu I quickly realized that I, that he was going to actually just be a, a dear friend of mine and that our work was going to be born of that together. And you talked about trust. And I think so much of that is, I mean, I think that that's what directing is. It's, it's trusting everything around you. It's trusting yourself. It's trusting everything that you've prepared yourself for. And it's trusting you giving yourself over to the present moment in a lot of ways. Um, and not trying, to, weirdly directing, when you hear the word, it sounds like controlling, but it's actually almost the opposite of that. It's like you control so you can let go, you know? And um, Miles had really taught me that. He, he taught me that. Um, he taught me to hold on so tight so you can just let, let things go. And, um, you know, working with him has been a, has been a light in my life, to be honest. And, and he's taught me so much about the practical side of the film industry because he's such a gifted filmmaker. Um, and we really, you know, he, he, I saw him see me, you know, he, he saw me and to, to, and to kind of bring it back around, um, I wasn't just complaining about my childhood before, uh, <laughs> um, that he, you know, to see a, a, another man a little older than me, see me and trust me and, um, be willing to be vulnerable to me and just listen to me. I mean, it's another reason, uh, it's, it's like Miles and Jamil have really been the two men in my life who I've been able to, you know, be totally vulnerable, uh, with, and it's been a real light in my life that way. And to, yeah, have somebody, even what you're saying, Maria, just what do you think about this? It's whether whether they take that or not is almost beside the point because it's not about the where you're getting, it's, it's how you're getting there and what you're learning along the way. And so even to just have your mind as a director's assistant think, well, here's, here's my take on it. Here's what I would do. Of, of course, if, if you're paying attention to yourself, there and you're being honest with yourself about and you're not just answering as like a performative monkey because you want to say the right thing mm -hmm. you can really learn a lot about yourself through that process and um i i feel like i've been fortunate to be in touch with that with myself and almost learn how to be a director alongside miles and also helping him as much as i can um in a i guess the way i think about it is I feel any relationship professionally, personally, it's, it's like this weird combination of both selfish and selfless growth. It's mm -hmm. both of those things happening at once. And so with Miles, I have to lose myself to, to make his work the best, but then I also have to be selfish to learn for me. Um, so that's kind of how I think about um, my, the, the two years that we've, that we've been working together. Yeah, no, that's, <clears throat> that's put really well. Um... I think, you know, you develop the confidence in all of that, um, which is Absolutely. of utmost importance. Um, Jamil, you've been a man of many, many hats. Like you've jumped around, you've had many careers, I feel like. Um, you know, you went to business school, then you were a stockbroker at Wall Street, 
you know, then you went oh, to Droga God. 5, you're an agency <laughs> producer. And I mean, I just, I want to know how all of these shifts, all of this jumping around has helped your creativity and like how if you bring, you know, those hats to your directing work. Yeah. Um, wow. Thanks for the question. Um, didn't expect <laughs> that past to kind of come up. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think my upbringing kind of called for that as well. Um, as far as how much it's kind of shifted and changed um, and how I've had to always adapt to that change. Um, I grew up as a military child uh, to um, a soldier and moved around 13 times, 12, 12 times in my life, uh, speaking three different languages and kind of my brain has always kind of processed things as like one or the other or such in like black and white um, because of always looking at things from like one point of view and the next of always kind of trying to grapple with the duality of these two different things existing in one body. Um, so that constant change and that constant adapting has always been um, a very central part of my upbringing in my life. And so, yeah, I, I, I went to business school. Um, I graduated, I had a Wall Street job locked in, ready to go, six figures at 21 years old. And just throughout the whole process of that, not enjoying anything I was doing and not finding any true value in it. Um, and the one thing that I always did, or at least with my parents, and I would always just sit and listen to a lot of the stories that they always had to tell me. And my mom would pull out old photos from a little town that she grew up in, in Lulu Budas, Turkey, which is like two hours outside of Istanbul. And she would show me photos and say all these stories. And my father would do the same. And I kind of always took that with me as a child. And I always wondered, as I would stare at those photos, I always wondered what the photo would have looked like a second before and a second after. And I think that might've been my little bit of thread that once I was introduced to the film industry, what I could potentially do to at least use it as a vessel in which to tell those things that I was always interested in. Um, because the film industry always did, and I'm sure many of you on this call um, might have felt this way other than Camilla because she was thrown into it seven months after she was born <laughs> um, but it always felt like a very far away thing that wasn't too tangible um, and I think I didn't really see it as a realistic career path and um, after jumping into the agency life and being a producer and uh, having being very fortunate to meet Pat that door kind of opened up for me um, and especially you know, for me, Pat, he was my first exposure, I guess, to the world of film and it actually being something that could actually be a career for you. And uh, I mean, I remember we met at this agency, Sachi and Sachi, in a little cubicle on the 10th floor um, or open cubicle. And we would just sit and just discuss movies all day, um, or at least the movies that I knew and loved. And then he would also do the same. And we kind of traded, you know, conversations, topics that we were interested in, music and all these things that, you know, aside from us just thinking that we're trading like titles and, and, and song names, you know, we're actually forging uh, a really beautiful friendship. And I think from that, I learned that maybe film could be something that could actually be doable um, and actually something that was of interest. And I think from that, that's from that relationship, I think that's where I myself found that like, I think I do want to do this. And I think I'm finding what it is that I want to do because I've always been into photography. I started off shooting a lot of photography and um, getting into film photography and, and running around with similar to like with a point and shoot and just shooting a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, shooting these moments to kind of map out and try to make sense of all these moments in your life. Um, and if anything above else, that's truly what I used a lot of photography for. Um, was to kind of like map out my brain in a way where it could try to make sense and to kind of now make those pictures mm -hmm. say things and score a song to it. it. It was that really interests me in a way that the medium of photography couldn't push that boundary and it, it kind of harped to why film is such a special thing within its essence. And uh, yeah, so all that jumping kind of brought me I guess to where we're at now and Pat I know 
we're really interested in kind of how that can how that consistent change is a thing that we try to shy away from but yet it's a thing that's inevitable and I think that within our films we never want to try to paint something as the definite end-all be-all and it, it should kind of be open-ended in a way where it should resemble life in that way I think we try to do so much to package life into this tiny little I wouldn't even say box but maybe try to make sense of it in a way where it's like you have to turn left here and then to turn right here and then to go straight here whereas that path is made as you are presently in the moment trying to make the thing that resembles the closest essence of who you are um and i think the more that you can be present for that you can look back on the journey and say wow look at all those lefts and those rights and those straights that you know we took or went through um and you know I think when you do look at that, you kind of do see all that jumping. Um, but mm -hmm. it, I guess almost like the way I look at my life is it, it might on paper look like a whole bunch of jumping, but it kind of resembles anyone's life if, if you kind of shift your perspective on how you might look at it. So um, say all that to say, uh, I guess I'm here on this podcast the way I should be. <laughs> oh, <Nothing> you. <yeah>. <laughs> No, you're right. There is like a fluidity that we kind of try to ignore in life mm -hmm. because you're right. We like set these goalposts and we just think like there's one straight line mm -hmm. to get there or like there's mm -hmm. only one way to make a movie or like there's only one way to tell a story and that's just not the case at all. Like everything is constantly changing. Everything is completely out of our control. And once again, taking it back to what you said, Pat, that you just, you have to be able to let go of that control. Mm -hmm. And that's really mm -hmm. the best way to like creatively move about life I guess um Camilla this brings me to you because you have certainly been in this world the longest out of all of us I mean you were you've been in it since you were nine months old which not many people can say 65 years old <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know you spent most of your career in front of the camera so I you know you have a plethora of credits to your name as an actress but I want to know at what point did you, you know, decide to step behind the camera and did it take long? Like, was it kind of like, oh, I'm going to start directing and then like the next month you were directing or did it take a while for you to really get the confidence to take on that role? It honestly took a long time. And I, it's funny because I, during this whole pandemic and my mom and I have been going through storage and boxes and you know cleaning houses I think many of us have been doing at least in the beginning of the pandemic and I found you know from my mom because I'm an only child too my mom kept every report every paper every from my whole life and I was going through all these you know creative stories and writing and also and I was like my god my imagination was a insane I was obsessed with really morbid topics and I was a little mom <laughs> what is this because I was actually a really happy kid but all I wrote about were deaths and suicides and cancer and murders and all kinds of crazy stuff and then but every single thing we're asked what you wanted to do I always wrote I wanted to be a director and but I had been acting that whole time and so looking back and I remember now as a kid the director to me was always the biggest dream like that was it you know that's when you made it was when you were a director and I think I was lucky that I was I always had great relationships with directors and and I worked with some really incredible people and I think because they kind of took me under their wing in a way and and made it seem accessible too that and I was always the kid behind the monitor and I was always with the crew like I was never the actor who just hung out with actors I've always the crew or they're my people, you know? So I've always, I've never, every time I have, I'm on set learning from somebody and in the editing room later and sound design. And I just love the whole process so much that I think it was almost inevitable. And, and, and as I got older, I didn't notice this until later as well, that I would have, you know, a production designer or a DP come up to me and say, listen, Camille, like when you, when you do this, call me, I'll be there for you. And I never equated that to, oh, wait, they're seeing something about me on set that isn't just the actor. It's all, it's the whole, you know? Um, 
But I think like you guys were saying, we put all these limits on ourselves and, and, and we put ourselves in these boxes and like, oh wait, maybe when I'm 40, or 45, I'll, I'll think about it, you know, or, or I have to be a certain age or I've had to achieve certain things in my life or whatever to even have made that jump. So only the last couple of years have I really even, A, took it seriously, B, took the time to even kind of, not as put acting aside, but in a way, yeah, just kind of going, okay, let me just put a pause on this for a second and take the time to think about ideas and write and see what opportunities I can have out there. Because in a way it's almost like starting over. And as much as I've been working for 30, <laughs> 33 years or something, but it's still, it, it's people seeing you in a different light, you know? And, and even though all those crew members said they'd be there, they're not the ones hiring you, you know? They're the people that will call to, to execute our vision, but they're not the, the hiring people so it's like you know so that that's a whole it's trying to get in the room again in a very different way mm. so it took me a long time honestly to kind of buckle up and go okay I want to see a if this is really what I thought it would be or even if I love it I don't I didn't even know I never gave myself that chance so once I did um then I became obsessed and loved it as even more than I thought I would. Um, and, and I go, okay, now can I do this in a parallel way? Cause I don't want to stop acting, but can I, okay, direct. And then also, and also one almost feeds the other. And I think like you guys said, that trust thing, it, as an actor, you, you know, you have to trust your fellow actor you have to trust your director, that director, actor relationship is everything and so I think being both it almost helps um and and it makes you even more empathetic I think um so long story short it's taken a long time <laughs> it was very recent <laughs> no I mean I hear what you're saying because I I have the fear of acting but I've force myself to take acting courses for that specific reason. Like I think as a director, you have to be able to understand what you're asking of your actors. You have to feel that vulnerability that you feel as an actor. And if you've never really been in those shoes, it's hard to, you know, actually relate to them. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember when your One Love campaign came out, I must've seen it like maybe a year ago. And I remember being like really moved by these reactions. And I actually didn't know you'd done it until recently. Um, but I want to know a little bit about the casting process behind that because you used real people, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was real people. We, um, well, before, could you describe oh, the sorry. spot for, no, 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 for sure, because the audiences who haven't seen it. it. It's for a nonprofit called One Love, and it's all about promoting healthy relationships and educating people on what are healthy and unhealthy relationships because you know we all think of I think most people think okay physical abuse that's that's not healthy but there are all these other very small ways of you know emotional abuse whatever it might be that signs right so it's all about the education process so then I came on to direct a spot for them last year um and we they kind of, and it was with, and that's also my first time working with advertising. You know, and I'm, as a filmmaker, I was like, okay, this is a new thing. Why not? Let's give it a shot. And so that's a whole nother realm of crazy because you're having just politically having to deal with not only the ad agency, but then also the crit and the many, the titles. I can't even remember the <laughs> hundreds of titles. All these people that you're going to talk to, like, what you do, what again? Um, but it was great because just it's it's a set times 500, you know, and you can't even remember everybody's name. And and also in a way I had to almost think of it with an actor hat because the end result is not yours. So you have to go in, mm. you do the best you can and you kind of put yourself out there. But at the end of the day, the final edit is not you. So that it's almost like giving, you have to give up, you know, just kind of walk away and go, okay, I did my part. And, um, but with the act, what they proposed kind of a difference. So I really worked with them on creating a new narrative for the spot, but then we 
past different couples and I was always very vocal okay let's have a diverse group di you know different people different backgrounds ages um let's just try and get as much as we can and also to try and get them to open up as much as possible about their relationships because to talk about abuse if they had been abused or to talk about unhealthy relationships so we had a whole audition process and they sent in tapes and we're watching all the tapes and then um and right off the bat, if you guys know, even with real people, like we can tell if someone's willing to open up or not, you know, and, and, and you can go, okay, maybe they're not yet, but if we get them in a room and we're able to really make them feel comfortable, they might open up more. And so there are a few of those. So then we had them come in and we shot it in New York. So the I think it was the day before we shot, a couple of days before we had them come in a room and talk to them. And I just kind of asked them all sorts of questions to see where they would go and how far they would go and there's like one couple that one of the women she was really physically abused for a long time and emotionally abused and she really opened up about everything and I always like are you okay you know talking about this I always want to make sure that they're going to be okay talking about that and she was so we found a really great group of people that were all really willing to put themselves out there and kudos to them you know a lot of it didn't end up on the final Peace, but they were very vulnerable and very willing to do so but yeah it was it was a great experience <laughs> you know something that you brought up especially working in the agency world reminded me a little bit of the round table that we had about art versus commerce um mm -hmm. and you know the balance of that and at one point like this is scale of it um but Haley I mean I'd love to know if you've noticed that you know like how as a director you've navigated that unavoidable relationship. And if you found that, you know, the larger your budgets get, the less kind of creative leeway, or if you haven't struggled with that at all. Um, yeah, well, I'm very, very new to um, working, basically just like actually working as a director and making money. Um, but it is a very interesting process, Camilla. It's very much surprising when you find how many people are behind something that airs for 30 seconds. It's such, um, you just have to kind of change the way you think about being creative and how you're presenting your ideas. I think very early on, because I had read up about a little bit of it, I, I was prepared to like let things go. Like I wasn't, um, I knew like, I compartmentalized it like I was already prepared to like okay this isn't going to be my like my baby but at the same time I take a lot of pride in what I do so I try to put as much as I can and whatever sticks sticks what doesn't doesn't because it's a job um I do think the last job that I did um I used it to experiment with a shot the shot didn't end up in the spot but I actually got the experience and I learned mm -hmm. okay when you're actually doing the shot in what you want to do it and do it in the opposite direction. And I learned that, <laughs> and that was really important. So if I can kind of use it to experiment and definitely to meet people, I think mm -hmm. I'm really, um, I just, just this last year, I've just tried to meet as many different people as possible. So it's a great um, way to do that and also pay your rent. So I, I think early <laughs> on, I already, prepared myself to be like okay this is not something you can't pour your per all of your personal <laughs> like life and soul into it but you can do if you can do one thing if you can get one creative thing out of it or experiment with something that you want to try in the future because you have all these resources kind of mm -hmm. uh, if they say yes to it then you, that's your chance to try something that maybe you you need to try in the future and you need a, a test run um, that's, great. that's a great yeah. one sure great that, that's kind of how I approach it. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with the idea just because I get to pay my rent. <laughs> nice. No, totally. When you think of it almost like a, a school assignment, like you're back in grad school, I'm like, this is the project and you kind of have to do it this way under these parameters, but you're still going to learn something from it. And then you, yeah. know, you can take that money, pay your rent, and then, you know, also like be financing your own projects. Yeah. Um, and then with every shoot that you do, it's still a shoot. There's still yeah. something to take from it. You're getting, you're like flexing your muscles. So it's like the more you shoot and even like back in film school, like the only th time I learned was when I was on set. 
so it's like the more you work the more time you have on set like the more you're like flexing those muscles so 100 percent. good thing yeah. um i want to go back to like the non-actors thing that we were talking about a little bit with um your spot camilla because pat and jamil i mean for gramercy you guys worked with non-actors like in every role right so yes. what was what was that casting process like? How did you find them? And then once you found them, what was the rehearsal process like? Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, I think uh, I think there. I think every, <clears throat> and this is at least something that Pat and I have at least talked about a lot and, and thought through, is that every single person and every single human being has their own truth, and I think it's about finding or at least trying to get a glimpse of what that truth is and then at least presenting or giving an environment where that truth can be expressed or shown um so with the guys um gramercy is essentially this brotherhood and this kinship that was built amongst these guys and for us to showcase that and to showcase what it was we wanted to talk about or at least give the room to speak on within the script. Um, we had that question of how do we, like, is it A, do we recreate this? Or B, do we look at what's in front of us? And mm -hmm. that conversation probably ended in like two seconds because it was the latter. And it was like, this is what's in front of us. Um, and I think it was exactly what Pat was saying earlier was we put trust in that. Because when we saw it, it was something that, sparked something enough in us to say I'm very intrigued by this and this would be an interesting canvas in which to paint this this idea in which we've wanted to express for a while and when we found these group of guys um, it felt like the perfect canvas in which to express it um, so for full transparency one of the guys in the in the uh, in the movie Chad who's the guy on the right hand side of the party walk up. He, him and I went to school together. Uh, him and I forged a really tight relationship. And so I've known him now for almost a good eight, nine years. And um, he is the one that introduced me to the area of Gramercy and his, his upbringing. Um, and then um, I was able and very fortunate enough to be like, Pat, you gotta see this. And yeah. The rest kind of just started to fall into place and yeah for us it was kind of we always from that very first moment of like is it something we recreate or something that we're using in front of us um once that conversation was easily had and we knew what we were running with we realized that if we lean into it we're gonna actually get to the truth of what we want to as opposed to trying to impose something on top of it. Um, and meaning we really used our script as this blueprint for these guys because we didn't expect to write a whole bunch of dialogue and then for them to nail exactly every single word in the way in which we saw it on the page. It was more mm -hmm. so a blueprint of them to read it and translate it for what feels right in their own way and in their own body. And that's kind of what was translated onto screen and some you know some of the jokes that they're firing back those are things that we could have never written ourselves um and yet we found so much levity and gold and magic within some of those moments that you know it feels as if I myself am talking to a homeboy on the phone and it's like man this feels so rich or organic to the point where you could turn this off and I could turn to my friend and say the exact same things and it, it, it felt that familiar and I think we wouldn't have gotten that if we didn't, if we wouldn't have gotten that, we went with the traditional route of trying to cast and rebuild this energy that we already had found. And I think within a lot of our projects, we kind of lean to that aspect of, I guess, what we can consider like non-traditional actors or first time actors. Um, it just, I think there's a lot of film avatars that we just love that kind of like Abbas Kiarostami is one of the filmmakers that we adore where a lot of his scripts, he would have these drafts of scripts where he would write what he thinks is true to him. And then when he finds that in his day-to-day -day life, 
he then finds a way in which to recraft the script around this life that he found. And it was, it's weird that we kind of did the same thing before even being exposed to this filmmaker's work. And then obviously when we were exposed to it, we were like, oh, this is the guy. Um, and it, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I don't want to say that that's the only way in which we like to work. Um, I think it's the one that we've worked with and the only way I guess we've worked at this moment, at this point in time um, and kind of fell in love with it. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to speak, I already speak a lot. I'll let Pat kind of jump in, but um, <laughs> I, I absolutely love the process of kind of finding people who feel that familiar or um, that close to you in a way outside of this thing that you're actually trying to do, which is like shoot the film. Um, but yeah, and, and I think I think all of that is so well said, and that you know, I think sometimes we were talking a lot about. Um, putting things in boxes through this whole conversation and putting things in labels. And I think that the distinction between actor and non-actor is sometimes a little binary, you know, and that like, I've been acting my whole life as me, you know, and that like, we're all acting roles in different ways where, you know, we play certain parts. When you go to a party, you're doing, you know, you're this kind of yourself. And I think as a, as a director, you kind of just have to know what kind of cinema you want to make. I mean, I think that that's what's so beautiful about the the art form and the language is that there's not one or right or wrong way to do it. It's just kind of seeing how you see the world and trying to, you know, put it together in this weird, messy way. And so I think, you know, at professional actors um, are amazing. And, you know, I wouldn't cast me as John F. Kennedy to like, you know, play him in a biopic, but I would, you know, I, but it's, so it becomes like, if that's what you're trying to do and tell that kind of, you know, very linear scripted kind of, you have certain needs for certain parts, actors are amazing, right? Like they, they do things that most people aren't capable of doing. But I think with Jamil and I, the way we approach cinema is kind of seeing things in people and trying to bring that kind of to try to create a language around that. And I think with Gramercy, so much of the language of the film came from the people that we met. And so, um, and it became about crafting a language around who they were. And like Jamil said, that's kind of how we've um, always approached uh, that. And so, you know, with someone like Shaq, who is the main character, what we saw in him was somebody who had a certain vulnerability compared to some of his other friends. And that there was something interesting about that, whether, you know, he knew that or we knew that or whether we were, it was just something that we all sensed, you know? And so it became about, well, what is that like? What is it like to, what is it like to be that person in a, in a group of friends where, you know, you feel like you can't quite uh, be your, you're going, you know, you're kind of splitting your soul up and creating a duality between this outer and inner life that you're experiencing. And um, like Jamil said, I don't know if we could have, like we could have casted an actor for that, but we had, we had it in front of us. And so we, we thought to, thought to run with it. So seeing that you cast a real group of friends and we're telling a story that was very much immersed in their world, as a director, did you ever feel like you couldn't give a certain direction or, you know, at what point do you draw the line of like, well, no, actually, I think this is how you would do it but like they didn't want to do it that way. Like, did that ever come up? Good question. Um, I, I mean, Pat, I think, I wonder, I mean, we had a pretty, we were pretty honest, I think amongst like, if there was something that we felt like working, we kind of, we just, I take if, if we were getting to what it is that we were trying to to get to um there, uh, there wasn't anything that's kind of glaring as to right off the bat noticing that oh this isn't working do we need to change the direction entirely to get to something very specific because it did feel like leading up to us shooting it everyone was very much so on board with what it was that we were there to do um mm -hmm. And I think it was about making sure that we're creating the environment to get to the most organic part right. of every single scene that was crafted. Um, so if anything, it might've taken a couple of takes to get there. Um, but I think eventually, um, I would like to say that Pat and I were 
very much so there to help guide it in the right direction as opposed to trying to push it into the right that's direction. That's right. Right. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's what I was going to say is I think that it was when, when we, we definitely came up with those impasses where something wasn't feeling the way that, you know, it, that feeling that you get in your chest where you're like, uh, something's not, you know, clicking here. Um, and you don't totally know why we, I think when that feeling arises, it's less about what can I push to get what I want and more like, what, like, what, what can I, what, what small thing can I give that person so they can find it themselves? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of how we approached it. So there were definitely times where like, we're like, Hey, do it this way. And then they do it that way. Like, okay, that was bad. You know, like, so let's, yeah, yeah. so let's figure it. So what, so, the, so then it just becomes like, okay, how would you do Like, what, what do you think? How right. are you feeling about yeah. that? You know? And it's like, well, right. I don't think I would say this. I think I would do that. Okay, great. Then just say that. And then, you know, you let go yeah. and then suddenly it's there and you're like, okay, cool. You know, you, then I think it goes back to that idea that we were talking about, about control where when you, you can feel the, yeah, when you feel like you got to control everything, then you're going to, be disappointed in what you're not getting versus um, the discovery of it, I think. Yeah, no, I find that as a director, it's so much more asking questions than oh, like actually time. giving directions. That's a Man. great way to put it. That's it. It's, That's everything. It, That's everything. It's funny. Uh, as you were saying that, pal, I was thinking, because I remember for the argument scene between Shaq and k -Ron, I remember Shaq asked us, like, how was that? And we literally asked him, like, well, what did you think about it? And as soon as we asked him that, he had a plethora of answers. Though. He did. So he was like, well, well, I don't actually, know. It didn't feel great because X, Y, Z. Right. Right. So it, it was I was like, cool. He had the question. <laughs> right. So yeah. it was funny that he had the question. Yeah. Um, and yet he could have then answered it himself. So I think it was yeah. trying to, again, be that sounding board. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, hearing all those, hearing all those answers, it was kind of like then from there guiding that. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's funny you said that. I, just, I truly just thought because well, it's like, and I'm curious, that. Camilla, to ask you about this, because, you know, like when as an actor, I feel like, you know, just equating it to myself in normal life, if, if I'm having a conversation with somebody and it's weird and awkward, I know that it's weird and awkward and that it's not going well. Or if I'm on a date and, you know, it's, it's the, <laughs> we're not vibing. Like the, I don't need some third party to come in and be like, hey, you guys don't have any chemistry, you know? And so I wonder, I wonder like as an actor, do you come up, <laughs> sorry, not to bring my dating life into this. Uh, I'm wondering as an actor, if you, you know, if you feel that when, is, if there's a disconnect between what, what you're feeling in your gut and in your body as you're in, in a scene versus like what the director is telling you and how do you reconcile those things when you're on set? Oh, absolutely. And, and, that, and that's when it comes down to a quote unquote good director, not good director, mm -hmm. when it comes to the actor relationship because there are plenty of directors I've worked with where technically speaking, they were phenomenal, you know, and, and, um, and it was kind of mind blowing what they could do on the technical side of things as far as shots and how many cameras and the, all the toys and all that was just mind blowing. But then when it came to working with the actors, not so much, mm -hmm. you know, so then, and then there are other times where you work with someone, where it kind of magically, everything comes together. And I think it's that sensitivity of what you're saying. It's, it's just being in tune and, and almost, I feel like it, a, it comes down to casting that I feel like there's no more important choice to make as a director than casting and be it non-actors or actors because they still have to have the essence of that character even if they're they've trained or didn't train or they have the experience not the experience they have to have that essence or that you can see something in them that they have it they don't even realize they have it and that's what's even more fun right and so that that relationship is so important and and that ability to ask the question like, how did you feel about that and a lot of the times we as actors are so insecure <laughs> <laughs> we're like we don't know you know but then but sometimes as an actor you do know like wait I know there's something I there's something left here that I haven't done yet let's just do it again like I don't need any direction let's just do it again and and then all of a sudden like then it becomes something you know so it's it's kind of it's just it, I feel like it's all very individual in a strange way but it all goes back to what you're saying is that trust and that a, for the directors to be vulnerable for the actors so that the actors can give that back. You know, I think that's, it's that trust ultimately that 
you're allowing the space to be safe enough for the people to go there emotionally if need be and for you to be there to be that sounding board um, to a either ask a question or just let's just do it again you know and see what happens really I don't know if that answered your question at all. Yeah, <laughs> No, I mean, that's like the magic of collaboration. Not one person on set has all the answers, you know? To think that the director has all the answers is just silly because right. it, no, there, first of all, there isn't just one answer, but then to pose those questions and to ask of your actors, well, what do you think about it? And to really get to the core of something as a team or ask your DP like, well, like, what do you think we should do here? Like, that's, that's the magic, you know? Mm -hmm. Not one person should be like, oh, I'm the only one who knows what's going on here, you know? But someone, I heard, I know I forget who it was that told me, I forget who it was, it said that for the director though, you have to always maintain a sense of control and the sense that you do know all the answers. Mm. And if you know nothing, that even like wardrobes, like, do you want the orange shoe or the yellow shoe? And you really couldn't care less and they're both fun, the orange shoe, but then maybe later, like, actually I did want the yellow shoe. You have to go back and like discreetly say the yellow shoe, but like <laughs> always, you know, in front of everyone, like you have the answer, you know what you're doing, the confidence and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a really good Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pat, something we've- right? <laughs> What? It's all perception. It is all perception, it all is. Um, but Pat, something we've kind of talked about is, you know, how a director views their work and how they look back at work they've done and just the continual evolution of an artist. And you've posed this question much more eloquently than me. So I'd love for you to just pose this to the group. Yeah, um, yeah well, so I, I think with Jamil and I, with our last film, Gramercy, we released it, it premiered at Locarno in August. And so we've spent the last three or four months uh, showing it at film festivals and talking about the film and putting ourselves back to where we were within the three years that it took to make the film between developing it and pre-production, raising money, shooting it, editing it, and then, you know, the latency period between the, that you wrap it in festival. And Jamil and I have this realization as we've been talking about Gramercy that we today as the spokesperson for the film are no longer the same people that made the film in the past. And so we are kind of constantly searching for where we are now in that film. And if, you know, what is our responsibility and our relationship to our past work as artists? Um, and what is that, what is that responsibility and what does it mean going forward? Um, and, you know, I, Actually, Haley, I'd be really interested to hear you talk about this because for full transparency, I'm a, you know, I'm a huge fan of your work. I think that you're an incredible filmmaker and I've, I've seen all your work and I think that there's something really, there is some through line that I've seen in your work that I see. I see it in the, the way that you, the way that the, the characters in your work deal with expectations that society has put on them and yet they find these incredible human moments to just especially the way that you depict touch in your films is so beautiful. And you, it's like th these, these moments in between moments in between all these expectations that are being put around us. And where do we find our humanity within that? Not to, you know, that that's how I see your work. And yet all of your work is so different and there's such uh, variety in your film. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Thank you. First of all, that's cool to hear. <laughs> um, um... Yeah, I mean, I'm def it's project to project. Um, hmm, this is like such a meaty question. I think it's, um, I think I am, there is this, I like to, I mean, oh God. <laughs> therapy um, time. <laughs> yeah, it's like therapy. Uh, recently, I mean, it's just like last week that I realized, oh my God, I'm telling the same story. It's, I'm telling the same, mm. I'm tell talking about the same thing from different in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about these things that I remember or these fears that I have in different ways. I'm just approaching them from a different way. Um, yeah, I like had I, I just came off of like a huge like two week writer's block and I had to think about everything that I've done and I'm like, oh my God, I'm just 
talking about the same thing, <laughs> um, but it's all hidden. Um, and so I, I think even though I, I think I approach everything, I'm trying to remove myself from everything I make. Um, first of all, this is, this is the question is how I relate to how an artist relates to their work. Is yeah, that, like you, you as an artist now, how do you relate to your mm -hmm. work in the past? Right. Well, so, okay, my last film, um, in the moment, I was talking about something that was in the past, like far buried in the past. And then right after I finished it, some, like I had an experience and suddenly the film became so real to me in a way that I didn't expect. So like Pillars for me is so like fresh and, and, and it was like, oh, I needed this film. It was like, I future me and you, I needed it in some mm. way. Um, and then while I was making Pillars, um, the film that I made maybe like three years before, I thought I was finished with it. And I am a totally different person from when I made that film and am now trying to figure out how, I, how I'm gonna talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, even though those things, you know, I, I, it's like I made it as an exercise and I think it's coming out in December and I'm like trying to figure out how I wanna talk about it. Cause I'm just mm -hmm. like, I'm not the same person <laughs> at all. Um, but at the same time, it's still, that film still has that thread of where I can look back and be like, oh my God, I'm sort of processing the same thing over and over again from a different perspective. Um, and and I mean, I'm, I, now I'm at a point where I'm trying to, I, I already feel myself changing. You know, I, I'm not, in the moment, I don't force myself to kind of trying to tackle something that I'm not ready to tackle. And I think that's why I like so far I found the same thread because I'm like, I'm not ready to move on from this, but now I already feel myself sort of changing. So I think you just have to kind of feel it out and go with what, you know, whatever, you know, I guess your heart is telling you, I don't, that sounds very trite, but it's actually kind of true. Um, yeah, it's a weird, it's weird. And, and it's, it happens without you really thinking about it sometimes. Uh, yeah, I try, because another thing I try to do is, is try to remove myself completely from things that I make. Mm -hmm. And try. yet you're the person making it, you know, and so yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a paradox, yeah, it, it is. It, it's, it's about like yeah. working with actors. Um, I don't like controlling, it's about the whole, it's what we've been talking about is like letting go of control. I am so into that and it's so freeing. I think the only control that I feel like I have is like over how it looks in the shots. Mm -hmm. Everything else you have to completely, like you just have to let it go mm -hmm. or else you're gonna miss something. <laughs> um, you're, you're gonna, if you like smother it, it you're gonna kill it. <laughs> it's like um, your thoughts, you can have a notebook, you can have three notebooks before you get on set. And once you get on set, you really need to be comfortable with the idea of throwing everything out. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not, I mean, like, I, I just think that um, I, I've, and I'm, I'm interested in exploring this, this method of filmmaking where you plan everything. I'm very interested in that. And I feel like it's a good experience to have. And I need to do that for myself to be disciplined because, you know, you, you can also go far too far the other way where nothing, you know, nothing is planned. But I, I feel like um, this certain feeling of, of, you know, letting yourself go and you know, in the end, you can never get away from yourself. Obviously, I've said like there's the same thread through my work. You can, you can never, never get away from it. So, you know, what you really want to make is going to, it's going to come through. I think. I was like, I think on what you're saying, Haley. It's like every, but every, even if you're saying like, oh, I'd like to try really planning everything, but maybe that doesn't work for you, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Everyone has yeah. Yeah, I think process like, and it's. I think it's about owning up to that. Mm -hmm. You're not the person that has everything storyboarded and shot listed and yeah, yeah. That's I think, okay. Like that's yeah. you know what I mean. I, I think it's like um a choice. I feel like um what I try to do makes things harder for me. Mm -hmm. For me, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. I have anxiety attacks before I shoot. Like it's very hard. I'm not I would feel more comfortable having everything planned. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, I'm like 
I don't, I don't know. I find more fun in the thing that is not planned. That discovery. Yeah. Like I'm completely like working, working in like doing an ad. I'm very like kind of relieved because I know things are going to be storyboarded. It's like, oh, this is, this is kind of nice. So I think it's because I don't want to feel like lazy. Maybe. I don't know. It's my, so I'm like trying to trick myself into thinking I'm like working or something. I don't know. Um, no, it's funny you say all of this because seeing your work and something I wanted to talk about was the pace of your films. You know, there's a deliberate meditation in them. There's so much room to breathe, which I think a lot of young and rising directors are a little scared of. Like, you know, they just want it to be like quick and to the point. And I mean, I just now kind of hearing this that you kind of go into it and just find it on the day because seeing it, like so many of those moments feel very deliberate, but I guess it's just you being open to what happens and then capturing it. Yeah. And I'm not sure where the question is there, but just a thought. <laughs> But it, everything is not, it's not a mistake either. Everything mm -hmm. is very delivered as well. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I am planning. Maybe it's the same thing. It's like, I'm trying to, and then it just catches up with you and the thing happens. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's um, because also it's probably like the budgets that I'm, I'm like, I'm, it's, every project that I've worked with has been like a very small student film and I'm trying to do too much. And so that's, there's some pressure there. And what I'm trying to do is probably too much for what I have. Um, I think it's all, I think a lot of the having to let go is like, because I work with a lot of first time actors, um, things are not gonna come out the way that I expect them. They're not gonna come out the way it's written on paper. Um, a lot of my locations fall through. So I just have to make those, I have to be comfortable with making these like really quick decisions. Um, yeah. And because I've been through that experience and that's like crunching a lot into a small period of time and with a small budget, it's like, I feel like I'm used to it, which kind of goes back to why I think I make the films that I make is because like the, my feature is about like travel and, and characters always kind of in transit and they're like moving. And I realized that about myself, it's like, I'm not comfortable staying in one place because that's how I grew up. And so it's, it's just like, it kind of catches up with you things mm -hmm. kind of catch up um yeah but it, and then so I'm like I battle against the idea of like oh then she's not planning anything like it just happened and she just found it and there's nothing deliberate about it actually there's a lot deliberate about it <laughs> you know, there's it's I'm somewhere in between and I haven't quite figured it out yet but everything's deliberate not everything is planned <laughs> if that makes sense it's, it's kind of a contradiction. <laughs> it does. It's hey, not. It's not. It's not a contradiction. No, okay. what it like sounds like false binary. Is, yeah, right. you just kind of open open yourself on the day. Yeah. So you know, like on the day, what's happening is deliberate. You know, but right. it might have not been planned the day before. Yes. But you show up and right. you're present, yes. and that's what's important. Yeah. It's like that's you know cool. what you're hunting for. That's yeah. what I'm saying. And that's, that, that's an approach to life too, right? Like it's yeah. like you could be open to what's around you or you could be closed off and you could be narrow and you could be like, right. I got to get from here to here and I'm not going to see what's around me. But then you, you know, when you make that decision to be open, like you said, that's a decision to, to be open like that. You look and holy, you know, whatever, there's a beautiful flower right here that I'm staring at and it has my attention because I was open to it. And yeah. Um, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a decision you make for sure. Yeah. And you're being deliberate about making that decision. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, something you kind of touched on was just how you, you have to pivot on the day, especially with small budgets. I mean, even with big budgets, you know, everything can change. It's snap of a finger. And Pat and Jamil, I remember when you guys were doing Gramercy, um, I don't remember if you guys had already started shooting or it was the day before, but one of your main plot points, there was you know, there were issues and you had to completely change your script. So could you just talk a little bit about that and the result of it? I know this whole time we've been talking about plans and not to sound cliche, but I guess the best plan is almost to have no plan. Um, but if anything, that's a very deliberate plan. Um, <laughs> so let me stop saying that. Um, yeah. Uh, so our the script, so in every single scene, um, the car that you see in the movie, uh, the car was in every single scene. Um, the car essentially can become a symbol for so many different things. And one of them being 
it was kind of a symbol of this young man's mental state and his his own mind, if you will. Um, kind of it being the thing in which you can find the most comfort in, um, especially like driving around alone and kind of being in one's thoughts and dwelling on them or kind of talking to yourself in the car. And people have this interesting facet of feeling so alive in their own cars where like you pull up to a light, someone's in between, like between these four doors and they're like singing their heart out. And then they look to the right and they see someone looking at them and they stop. But yet for that second, they were being the most authentic part of themselves. So in a way you're so authentic by yourself in this vehicle. And yet it can essentially be one of the most dangerous things that you can operate on your day-to-day life. I mean, you know, hopefully no one would ever, or hopefully you don't get into an accident, but that is a possibility. So it's this kind of this interesting duality of peace, serenity, and kind of danger. Um, and we saw that as such a beautiful symbol for Shaq and what he was going through. So the car represented that. And that's a big reason why we wanted to have the car as the through line throughout the whole script. Um, the way of the world did not want us to tell the story that way. Uh, so after the first shot on the first day, um, we were driving back to Shaq's house and we got a call that Shaq got into a car accident on the way back. And I mean, first, first and foremost, the first thing was, okay, well, how was Shaq? Because no one had said that yet. Um, and they're like, no, Shaq's good. Shaq's good. Um, the car is totaled and they sent us like a snapshot and the car was just like busted. And we were like, damn it. Um, and <laughs> it, 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 it hurt because obviously it's a thing that was a through line throughout the whole script. But secondly, aside even from the movie, this was the car that Shaq got when he was, what, 15 or his father found and tuned up and built for him. And it was like his baby. I mean, the car is called Malcolm, Malcolm X. Um, and this was his baby. And to see him distraught after that happened, it was it was definitely crushing. And I think at that moment, it at that moment it was like everything that we had planned for or thought we wanted to get if we were so stuck on that very thing going into the day we would have not been able to look beyond our own cocoon to see that this wasn't the way we were supposed to tell it and when we became very open to what that was and how it kind of presented itself that this script also now needs to be or this story needs to be told without this car um that's how we did it and that's it it was it was kind of it was funny because it it never again we didn't plan for any moment of this car not being there but yet when it happened it was like every single decision that we made was for the fact that he didn't have this vehicle that we were that he's supposed to have in every single scene and yet every single scene that we got to we knew exactly what it was that we wanted to do because probably we Pat and I would take like five or 10 minutes between like a take of something and be like, Hey, we need to think about what we're going to be doing next when we go to this next, uh, next location. So it definitely became a thing on the fly, but we again, really went back to the truth of what it is that we were trying to tell. And I think that's what became our guiding light as opposed to this thing that we truly did want that our heart was telling us that we wanted, um, but since it just didn't work out that way, it was a matter of trying to find out the way in which to still tell that truth. So. Yeah, can I, I just wanted to quickly share a quote that reminds me uh, so much of what, what, we're, what, we, what you just said, Jamil, which is this great quote by uh, the great writer Ursula K. Le Guin, which is, uh, the only thing that makes life possible is permanent, intolerable uncertainty, not knowing what comes next. And I think that, that that idea of that total uncertainty and that no matter what you're doing, whether it's, you know, we're in the middle of 2020 and there's a pandemic and you've lost your job or somebody you know has gotten sick or you're on a film set and something has happened, life is uncertainty. And it's, and, you know, I think there's no question that uncertainty because of who we are, it breeds fear. And you can let that fear become part, of, you can let that fear guide you into, um, 
dark places or you can, uh, like Haley was talking about so beautifully, you can let that uncertainty become openness and become possibility. And um, I know that in sometimes in life that's harder than others, but I, I truly think of filmmaking um, as a reflection of life lived. And I think really it, the best version of filmmaking for, for me is that. And so, you know, back to the car, it's like, yeah, everything, you know, yeah, our whole script, we had to change while we were shooting it. And yeah, like, you know, we were like, damn, man, what are we going to do? <laughs> uh, but, you know, what else are you going to do? You got, you, we're all there. We have to do it. We got to, you know, we're, we're not going to be like, okay, bye everyone. Hey. You know, you got to. We got you know, a whole you, bunch of crew here and some, in in a camera at you. So that's not cheap. Yes. So yeah. you better start shooting something. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Scary. Yeah. Oh my God, everybody's here because I made them be here. What am I doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I did this. I wanted this. What do I do now? You know, <laughs> that's the way you, Kaylee, you were talking about anxiety on the shoot day. And I like that, that feeling of, because I, I think about this a lot of how filmmakers and all of us on this, on this round table have experienced this, the, I, that every film started with a notion or an idea you know, somewhere, whether it was some your childhood and then it came, but at some point you decide, I want to try and make this into art and um, how we have a million, million thoughts coming in over our head every single day. And yet these ideas, they stick. And so, you know, to make a film what, that right before you get on set, you, all you realize this little thing that came into your head one day, it, it, and you spend years trying to make it and get money for it. You're like, Oh man, this is about to happen. <laughs> what have I done? What have I done here? And, and, uh, and, and on that same yeah. flip side too, realize how beautiful of a thing it is for you to have that mm. idea, that one idea that stuck between the myriad that flew by, mm. that one that stuck mm. that you kept on going with. Mm. Like year, mm. Years, months went by and yet you are now about to shoot your first shot of on the first mm. day and how beautiful it is that you're looking around and you see all the people who are like rallied around this thing that you finally typed in your blank final draft doc mm -hmm. and you're like wow I can't believe I got somewhere with this and that's such a that's I mean I guess I keep saying we're beautiful but it's nothing less no, than that is. you know and it's like even Camilla at the beginning of this call when you were talking about <laughs> during the pandemic you looking at your younger self and this and that you you looking at this imagination and you're like holy holy shit man that's me you know like that's that that's the same imagination it's the same person trying to make movies now and connecting to that it's so beautiful yeah no it's it's a huge privilege you're right Jamil that moment where you like look around and you're like wow everyone's here to do this together and this is an idea that was just like in there long ago and now we're all here it's it is magic um We've been talking for so long, but there's so much more I want to say. So I'm just going to, I kind of want to talk about the director DP relationship. Um, and Camilla, we've been fortunate enough to both work with Nico Aguilar, who is such a great collaborator. Um, and I just, I'd love to know how you stumbled into working with him. And as, you know, someone who's worked with a lot of cinematographers as an actress, what was important for you when looking for a cinematographer? Like, what did you, focus on? I, well, I think I had seen collaborations that worked so well mm -hmm. and others that didn't. That also gives you a lot of hindsight. And probably the DP direct relationship that I always wanted to emulate, um, I worked with Rebecca Miller and Ellen Kuras, and they had worked on two other films, I think, prior to the film we did together. And their relationship was just perfection and I remember I was 16 when I worked with them but still I, I remember just watching and that this is magic this is what it's supposed to be and I hope to one day have that and it was just similar to what we we're talking about trust and they hardly had to say anything to each other and they just knew just by look and um it was so beautiful to watch that connection that they had and so I've always wanted to find that eventually one day and then randomly on this uh, feature anthology that I wrote and directed a part of it, and we had to all, as a collective, as five filmmakers, meet two DPs. So one DP was going to shoot, 
two or three of them. The other one's gonna shoot another two of the shorts within the anthology. And so then we all got together and interviewed Nico. And literally the first thing out of his mouth was like, this guy, I, I love this guy. And he's, for you guys, he's from Mexico and is the most like gangly human possible. <laughs> like I can't even <laughs> imitate him. But there's such joy and, and, and we just connected right off the bat because of, I think from my mom being from Brazil and my favorite filmmakers and, and who I always connect to are kind of the Latin filmmakers and that's the aesthetic I've, I've always been drawn to and the type of material I've always wanted to make, be it bilingual in Portuguese or Spanish, whatever it might be. And so we, and he connected the most to my script because of that. And so we really, um, bonded off of culture, off of language, off of um, visual inspiration. And, and it really became that relationship that I hoped to find. And I feel so lucky that I found him so soon in this side of my career. Um, and so that's kind of how that happened. We've gone on to do other things together and we hope to do much more together, but it's that communication of not, and it's that trust that we keep on going back to. It's like, you know, he, he knows he can come to me with an idea and I'm not gonna poo poo it. I'm gonna say, yeah, let's try it. Or if it's really awful, and I really don't like it, I'll say it. But like, there's no, there's no BS, there's no filter. It's just completely raw. I think that's what we want with any relationship on set, but particularly with your DP, because they are the ones absolutely executing what's in your head that you can't even vocalize. They, they do it for you, you know? So that's kind of, um, and when I've seen it work really well, it's, it's with different directors and DPs, it, it's really just magic. So, you know, I think, um, yeah, and, and it's funny because you feel, you see certain directors and they do work with the same DP since film school, but then, you know, then they'll, they'll work with other ones here and there, but they always have their, their work husband or wife <laughs> that they go back to, um, but yeah. Haley, I'm curious how once you moved to New York and, you know, started your career there as a director, how did you go about finding DPs? Like, would you find people and then bring your idea to them or were people already aware of your work and they would reach out to you? Um, no, I was very fortunate. Um, film school is mm -hmm. the thing I remember. Um, I mean, I think the one that happened that just I kind of fell into it was my collaboration with Jomo Frey. Um, it was, I think I had asked a DP, uh, a, a bigger DP at the time who had probably just graduated and had made, I think, a short that I really liked. And I emailed, um, I emailed them, and I think that the answer that I got back was like, "Be true to yourself." <laughs> and I think it was because I gave them a lookbook or something, and I felt so like insulted. I was like, "Of course, I'm going to be true to myself." Like, what? <laughs> and I was like, and then it ended up like I'm too busy. I was like, well, well, now I look at it now, I'm like, of course they are too busy. Of course. Um, and then a friend had said oh you need to talk to um jomo and i was like okay mm -hmm. fine um so i just took a photo book to the meeting and i was like hey do you like vibe with this and then it turned out we like liked all of the same things um and yeah so i, I think it's really just energy um mm -hmm. and and i think with what i'm interested in now and what i'm interested in like maybe in the next two years the way i plan to make films it's like energy is really important um, and and vibing. And again, it's not like I'm against planning, but when you meet someone and you start talking and it's like, you just vibe on things, like they're open to vibing and it's like a back and forth. That's what I'm looking for. And that's what I've been fortunate to have so far um, is people that kind of throw things back at you, but not in a condescending way. Um, I've definitely been in positions where it feels like um, every decision you make is questioned. And even if it's not good, I, I love the feeling of, okay, let's try one for you and let's try one for me. Can I try one? And I think, you know, Jomo, Jomo's really good at that. It's like, oh, can I get one for me? And I'm like, sure. And then you look forward to seeing the other side. It's like, I, I'm really into like 
giving the DP one. Cause I, for me, I, I was telling my friend this yesterday. I was like, every problem that I have on set, it literally just goes to my DP. I, I talk to them. I should probably be talking to my producer, but I feel so close and so like, um, respectful of them that I, I feel like there's an answer in that conversation mm -hmm. rather than like a production conversation. Um, Ones that have your back anyway, the producer doesn't always have your back. Yeah, right. So. <laughs> I know, <that's> right. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but I, I just think it's like, as human beings, do we kind of get along? And as a human being, do you know what I'm searching for? And if you're open to searching for and recognizing what I think I'm searching for, um, then I think we'll, we're good. <laughs> um, being open, I think, is the most important thing because I'm open. You know, I feel like I'm pretty open and I'm available to what they have to say because mm -hmm. obviously, like the whole, like you were saying earlier, Camilla, like the vision of a director knowing everything is complete myth. And um, I want to find someone who will tell me what they think but in a respectful way, not like, oh my God, that is so stupid. Why would you make that decision? Um, Gosh, tell that and, and go home. <laughs> exactly, but I, it's like, um, it's a back and forth. I look for the back and forth and you can feel it instantly. Um, but yeah, that said, I think it's, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> New York City, baby. New York City. Um, yeah, I've just been really fortunate. I, I was in, in film school and I was fortunate to have people around and um, I got to meet different people and work with different people. And and yeah, I, it's been- Oh, I love what you said about, you know, giving the DP a shot because once again, you're learning, like you're gonna see something and then maybe that worked a lot better than what you were doing before. And then, yeah, just keeping an open dialogue is really beneficial, um, I find. Um, Pat and Jamil, you guys worked with Maceo Bishop, who is incredibly talented as a cinematographer and obviously has, you know, this impressive career as a steady cam operator. Um, and one of my favorite scenes in your film is the party scene and, you know, the walk into the house. And one of the reasons is that it's so hard to nail a party scene. Like you watch, especially, you know, <laughs> from like young you watch a scene you're like ooh, that like the background looks fake this doesn't feel like a real party and like you guys really have an energy that you're like damn i want to be at this house party um so i want to talk a little bit about how you plan that with maceo and with the actors like how do you get that energy there that's a fun one that's a fun one I'll, I'll start. I, you know, that I'm so glad that you said that. That's actually like the highest compliment you could possibly give us because the, <laughs> it was such a, I mean, we spent a year talking about this has to feel like a party. It can't be movie party scene where nobody looks like they're having any fun. And so we, I mean, to be honest, we, it started with the idea, I think this is actually a child of Jamil where it was just, like, let's throw a party, you know, like, let's throw a controlled party and, you know, get there. So the scenes where you're seeing them dance and it's the dance circle, like, that's us having them, you know, they're, they're, there's loud music playing and they're dancing and they're getting hyped up and, you know, it, in it, you know, it, it's kind of, it's become a, it's become a motif. Hopefully I'm not drilling it into the ground, but it's, you know, that trust. And with Maceo, we met him at a really interesting time in his career where, he was just, you know, he had this prolific resume as a study cam operator, like you mentioned, Maria, and, you know, worked with truly the seminal directors of photography in um, the history of cinema, you know, in the last 30, 40 years. And, but he, you know, he had it, he had a couple of projects as a DTP, but he was still kind of figuring out who he was going to be as a DP. And he, so it wasn't like we could point to his reel and be like, this is what we're gonna get. And, you know, Haley was talking about vibrations and energy. And I think the first time we met Maceo, that's, it was like, we knew within five minutes of talking to him that this was gonna be our guy. And that this was just somebody you could, you know, that A would just, I wanna be this human being's friend and I, and there's trust there. Um, so, when you just know when you're building that trust a year and a half out that when you get when it's time to get on set 
even though you're, you're naturally not going to align with every single decision that you, it can be an open conversation, you know, and with Maceo, I think that was the biggest blessing that we had working with him where when we, you know, we, we aligned on so much, we aligned on all of the right things and the stuff that we didn't, that, that we, that we separated on, we were willing to have conversations about it and get to a space where we were like, okay, well, that, I, that, that works for all of us. And, you know, that like the one take that we, um, the one take that kind of opens the party scene, Jamila and I had that idea of doing it as a one take. That was one of the first shots that we knew we wanted to do was just these guys following them. And, you know, I think Jamila, tell me if I'm, if I'm misremembering this because I do this sometimes, but um, I believe it was in that first meeting with Maceo where he brought up the idea of the serpent as the language of the, of the film. Maybe you can take it to take the baton from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I think before I even take that, I, to what you said, Pat, Maceo is one of the most beautiful and gentlest human yeah. beings I think I've ever met. Um, and aside from, I think every thing that we were doing there for the film I think it was to everything that Haley just said about who is the human being behind all of this like before we get into the trenches like do I feel like I know this person do I feel like this person knows me or if, even if you guys don't know each other can we get to know each other through this process and it's that mm -hmm. I know we keep saying this, this trust thing it must become I guess the word of this of this podcast but that that trust aspect it's it's you kind of find that in the very first meeting of, 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 of like seeing that person. And it's kind of like, if you're on that same frequency, you have to follow that. And I think with this, say, you know, um, you know, he's, he's a guy who he is, I mean, he's an unbelievable, amazing hard work. I mean, we're two hours mm -hmm. after our supposed to be wrap time during the party. And the sales just staring at us and he's like, we're going to get the shot. And he was like, not ready to rap. And it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's that type of individual that you obviously want to be in the trenches with, but then he's also the guy who's like, Hey, let's like, you know, what was it like a month before shooting? He's like, hey, let's, let's, let's go get a wine and like cracks open like two wine bottles and wants to just mm. be around <laughs> you to understand who you are as a human being. And I think above else, that's what we really wanted and to make sure that we had, um, and you know, we talk about grammar scene now, but yet we've forged such a beautiful, excuse me, I'm tearing up because of this relationship that we forged with Maceo. Um, but, you know, I say all that just to say he's, he's a unbelievable human being that I'm, I'm so grateful that we've crossed yeah. paths with. Um, but yeah, I think it was, as soon as we met him and we underst he understood kind of what it was that we were going for and he really saw himself in this thing that, we had shared with him and he felt like he could find himself as an image maker and and truly project what it is from his own personal experience onto this other thing that can help us speak in a way where we don't have to communicate with words and I think that that right there is where we found this ground of wanting to find what this language was in this film and I think the closest thing that he could relate it to and said was it has to feel like the serpentry, like this, this camera has a body and an essence of its own that's following this guy. Um, and that was truly pulled from, you know, a personal experience of what it might be if you're, if you're embodying this person who's going through personal internal struggles, it was kind of pulling from that realm as to trying to just find the coolest camera technique and say, yeah. insert here. And it was, you know, what's the language behind that technique? And then once you find what that crux of that language is, it's like, all right, now let's find what we need to do. It needs to be a steady cam here. Da, da, da. And you start to run through the list of how you actually execute that. But first and foremost, it was finding what that language was. And I think, yeah, five minutes in when he said that, Pat and I kind of looked at each other and we we're just like, Yep, this is the guy. Yes, um, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I hope he can, I hope he listens to this. Um, yeah, me too. Because we're definitely, definitely giving big shouts out. So, but no, of course, big shout out to Michelle and shout out to Claire for introducing us. Yeah. 
doing the and, sales. And, well. and also, and also, just quickly to add on top of that, uh, we were talking about kind of the production fiasco that we had. Having somebody of Maceo's experience oh, and yeah. wealth of knowledge to be a steady hand through that was so unbelievably valuable for us because you know Jamil and I were young directors and like we 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 are both supremely confident and know what we want, but to have somebody who you can look at and they're not panicking. They're not, um, mm. there's no sense of insecurity. It's like, cool, look at, you know, oh, captain, my captain, like, let's, what are we doing here? And then, you know, there's not a, there's no, the, the hand is steady. And then you look at that person and then suddenly you're like, right, okay, we're going to be fine. And to have that, I mean, it's like when you're going through a hard time in life and you, you know, you look at a friend and they tell you everything's going to be okay. It's not, again, it's not dissimilar to real life. It's just, you know, mm. extracted. It's just, it's just projected that outward onto a set where you're creating art together. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 every time I looked at myself, I just, all of a sudden, when I didn't feel confident, I was like, oh, I feel confident now. And yeah, I think that's exactly. kind of what Haley was saying too, where it's like, you feel like those conversations with your DP, you probably will find the answer through that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, to, to kind of let that be your guiding light when you might not be finding yours. It's like, that's that magic that a shot that ends up in your film and you're like, this is one of my favorite shots. I could have never thought of that. That's you not wanting to control every single thing. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, again, I think it also comes down with the person you meet and the DP that you bring on board because yeah. Maceo is probably like the one of the most selfless DPs, I would say as well. Like he is just he he has a very strong opinion of what he wants, but then he's like, let's talk about this. Like, is this the best shot? Is is this good? Is this not good? And you know, we'll get a shot. And he'll be like, oh, I didn't, I, I didn't think that was out that great. And then you know, we're adjusting from there. And I think it's that honesty that's what works because if it wasn't, and it's just you know this tyrant type of attitude towards what you're doing, it I think that both parties won't come out with the thing that they intended to go in with, you know? Um, so. That's what filmmaking is about. It's about mm, collaboration. Yeah. It's about, yep. mm. not about this one person. Yeah. No, it's not. It's the whole thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So true. Precisely. Yeah. It's funny because I feel like, yeah. Sorry, Haley, what was that? No, I was just going to say, it's not even fun that way. No, you know? it's not. No, but for the longest time, I feel like it was supposed to be that way, you know, like the yeah. tour, like that was the voice. But I'm glad that we've kind of, you know, gotten <laughs> out of that framework because yeah. I just think so much better work comes out of it when it's yeah. not that. Vulnerability um, brings growth. Yes. And that is the truth. Know thyself, baby. Know thyself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, before we hop off, I just want to know a little bit about what projects you're working on right now and what's cooking. So Haley, why don't you start? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, like I'm saying, I'm, I'm trying to finish the final draft of my feature. Came off of a two week uh, writer's block session. <laughs> Getting back. back on it, coming back. Um, finishing that, hoping to shoot next year. Um, writing something else that I, kind of came up with over the pandemic. Um, another travel story, but in a different way. Um, I started, I just reached out to this this actress across the pond and I don't know, we just kind of jumped off and jumped into it. And I feel like now the ball is rolling. So I'm really excited about that. And um, yeah, might be on something else. So two two projects at the same time, just in the writing, writing baby stages, but hoping to make a feature next year if everything goes well. What about you, Camilla? Sorry? What about you? What are you up to? Oh, um, I, well, also during the pandemic, I <laughs> also reached out to a writer I had met um, while I was actually shadowing on some TV shows early before when we could actually visit sets, whenever that was. Um, and we developed a TV show together. So we have that going. So, I mean, that's not even for me to direct this producing and whole nother hat, but so developing that, I mean, I'd like to direct an episode, but that's not, that's totally different. But, um, so that's been great. And another book that I had found that I read about a year ago and about a year chasing after and trying to get the option rights to, and we finally closed that deal two weeks ago and 
So I'm really excited because also about the Latinx girl in high school and dealing with racism and all sorts of illegal immigration, like really topical things that I know we're all passionate about. So I'm really excited to bring that. To, but also I thought as a director, I'm like, I need to find my directing piece now because I've been like, my, my, my brain, I don't know what happened, but it was kind of got a little skewed over this pandemic time. But I, I really have been trying to find what that next story is to get behind the lens and with that position. Um, and I'm very excited to do so. I think, I think like we're all saying, we need to find something that we're passionate about, that this is the story we need to tell and why. I think that's what I'm trying to, to find right now. Mm -hmm. Pat and Jamila, do you guys have something in the works? Got something cooking? Uh, yeah, no, I, it's, um, this has been a really interesting year. I don't know if you guys have heard, uh, but <laughs> there, uh, that it, you know, this guy, uh, you talk? You know, watch the TV. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a really interesting year and I think it's brought up a lot of, um, uh, personal excavation is what I'll say. And I've spent a lot of months journaling and a lot of months, um, uh, kind of piecing together things that I have realized I needed to work through myself on a personal level and putting them down into words and language and experience. And um, it, it's been really amazing to be on this journey of self-discovery and that this, you know, long winding road, it's not about a destination, but it's like get, getting there and being super present for it. And so that, I say that to say, it's been really uh, exciting to be developing a couple of, of kind of projects that truly feel like they are of, of me now. Um, so that's been really great. Jamil and I are, uh, have been kind of in the beginning stages of developing um, a modern day adaptation of uh, Abbas Kurosami, who we mentioned's first film, Where is the Friend's Home, that we want to set in New York, um, that that we're really excited about. So we're kind of, we're developing something like that. And then we're both writing uh, kind of these personal excavation. I'll obviously let Jamil, sorry, I'm Jamil, I don't mean to speak for you, but just, you know, we've been, we've been, we've been, we've been, we've been interestingly on these individual parallel paths of finding all this stuff within us and putting it on paper. And then, you know, we kind of come together on these calls and, you know, Sometimes I cry, sometimes I don't, and uh, you know we, uh, you know we end up just kind of like sharing with each other, and we we both push each other further. And you know we started a company last year called Seneca Village Pictures, which is just truly a company that Jamil and I operate out of. So every project that we ever make together, or you know, I mean, if Jamil ever makes something by himself, I'll be there to help in any way that I can, and vice versa. So you know that's been it's been really exciting to just kind of be doing that on these like kind of parallel lives mm -hmm. yeah what's that always with great hair <laughs> thank you i haven't cut it once since the pandemic so it's uh you know it's a little lot of, i was a little embarrassed to get on this call with it but you know no. i'm taking i'm taking your word for it oh it's flowing baby it's beautiful <laughs> thank you thank you hold on i'll give you guys a quick hair whip oh wait oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> i need to be in slow-mo <laughs> yeah. For everyone yeah. listening to this on the podcast, you might want to go check out the video because that was yeah, that was beautiful. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> don't miss out. Jamil, what about you? Yeah, um, I won't add too much onto what Pat was saying because I was so beautifully said. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think for everyone, this has kind of been a time of. I think it's been, you know, I, I've always and Pat and I always talk about this too, where it's like, and we talked about that idea of we make art that kind of is a piece of ourselves. And I've always seen the medium of film to be reflections of ourself that are growing through a period of time where the script you write, that same person isn't the person who's shooting it and it's not the same person who happens to be mm -hmm. editing it. And you, know, you, you as a person are developing and growing throughout that process. Um, and even after when that process is finished, when you then reconnect yourself with that piece, you are then a different person. And a year from now, you will then be a, a different person again. And your relationship with this thing that's constant will always continue to change. Um, and I think art kind of gives us that foundation to reevaluate ourselves and our relationship to the world at our present moment. And, um, you know, I think, of course, with something like 
kind of what we're struck with in the world today. We have a lot of time for that introspection. Um, and similar to Pat, I've been kind of just excavating a whole bunch of like my past and my childhood and been heavily inspired and I think is a crux of a lot of Pat and I's work um, of Andre Tarkovsky's The Mirror. We're kind of taking like fragmentation of memory and time and trying to make sense of it in this vessel where you're speaking to a truth that might not, not make the most sense from like a very linear point of view, but it makes all the sense from a thing that can't be expressed in words. And mm. very similarly, I've been, especially a person who's been growing up moving so much and in between two different, very different cultures of like, you know, I grew up to a, um, an African-American father who grew up, you know, in the inner cities of Cleveland, Ohio, and kind of to see his life story and where he made it to where he is today. And then, you know, my mother growing up in, or being born in rural Turkey and then moving to Germany in the sixties as like the big wave of Turks who moved from Germany to Turkey. I've always had this interesting con and then myself being a military child and moving around so much, I've always had this interesting concept in my head of what I thought home is um, and always associating it or trying to, when I was young, associate it with something physical when I think now I've realized that the concept of home is something so much more internal. Um, and so I've been mm. writing kind of like a semi autobiography, like a semi autobiography, autobiography, I guess you can say, sorry, um, <laughs> of the story of this, this young man trying to kind of make sense of, of time and place and what does home mean uh, in between, I guess, that construct in which we call home. Uh, so yeah, I've been kind of digging into that. And then again, what Pat said, as far as where is the friends, everything has home in it. That seems oh, to be baby. circling the theme. I'm, it's almost I mean, like even, it's right I here guess, in our hearts. Man. And <laughs> even, I mean, I guess even in the film before Gramercy, Fall River, which kind of turned into a personal excavation for Pat in many ways, um, which I was so fortunate to be in that process with it. It was funny where it started off Pat sending me a text of, him wanting to make maybe more so of like a very existential view on a, a city in which was very close to him. And then it turned into this, it couldn't be any more personal and very different from the thing that we initially, or at least Pat initially thought it would have been in his head. And it turned into this personal excavation of his relationship with his grandmother and her even kind of, I don't want to spoil the film for those who haven't seen it. I but love the film. It, 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 thank, yeah, it, it, it gets to this idea and it's funny that it actually made me think about what I'm writing now from what Pat's grandmother was saying, which was, you know, when Pat asked her that question of, um, like, do you think Fall River is a special place? And she had this answer that kind of is jarring a little bit, but I think she got to this essence of truth of what home truly is. Um, and it, it's truly about the individuals who are in that home as opposed to um, this physical place of home, which my home is actually. I just saw your home walk by. Your legs, yeah. She says, Meraba, hello. Um, so yeah, it's it's been, if anything, it, it kind of feels like this time makes us spend more time in our physical homes or wherever we kind of consider our home to be. And, I think it's actually trying to push us to find what home means internally. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I love that. Beautifully said. Beautifully oh, said. Yeah, no, that was really, really beautiful. Yeah. Call the mic drop. I think we can leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, thank you guys for coming on and talking and really diving into these moments and these like intimate revelations. I think I love hearing you guys all talk. Um, before we hop off, I want to give a quick shout out to the rest of my team. Um, we have Aaron Weil, Doug Torres, and Matthew Wolf behind the scenes um, in this whole film roundtable world. So thank you to them. Um, and thanks to everyone listening. Oh, yes. <laughs> a round of applause. Hey. Um, thanks, everyone listening, for your continued support of Film Roundtable. Um, follow us on Instagram to keep up with our upcoming roundtables. And you can subscribe to our website, yada, yada, yada. But um, yeah. Thanks, guys. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah. Our pleasure. Thank Maria, this is, is first off, this is, uh, I just want to, I guess, end it on this. This You starting this, or you and the team really, like, mm -hmm. pushing for yeah. this type of 
I guess, open dialogue and conversation for filmmakers to have. And it's such a beautiful thing. Um, I mean, I think that I don't want that to sound too cliche, but I think it's 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 worth noting that because I think a lot of us, we want and tend to always want to learn things, even when we might not raise our hand to be like, oh, I want to, you know, maybe reach out to this filmmaker to ask a certain question, but to kind of open this platform up for filmmakers to share those experiences, I think can do so much more than any book that we can pick up or any anything that we think we, any way we think we do learn, this is, I think, invaluable. So thank you and the team so much for, for making these happen. Again, well said. <laughs> Damage, Mel. <laughs> Two mic drops in a row. Stop it. <laughs> oh, no, but yeah, seriously, thank you guys. I'm so excited to keep an eye on all of your upcoming work. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.